Okay, you are live. Good every good morning, everybody, and welcome to the County Commissioners meeting, uh, November second. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, gentlemen, the first thing we have on our agenda today are the minutes. Do you have any additions, corrections, or comments? I do not. Do not. I would move to approve the minutes from the Tuesday, October 26th, Mosin County Board meeting. Second. Okay, it has been moved and seconded to accept the proceedings of the Board of Commissioners, Montezuma County, for October 26th, 2021. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, next up we have Don and Sherry Jane with planning. We actually have a uh, public hearing first thing. Yes, yes sir. With that? Okay, with that, Kim, would you uh, go ahead and call the roll? Commissioner Candelaria. Here. Commissioner Lindsay. Here. Commissioner Stevenson. Here. Administrator Powers. Here. Attorney McLaren. Here. Kim Purcell, Montezuma County Clerk and Recorder. Notice is hereby given that the Montezuma County Board of County Commissioners will hold a public hearing for a review and determination of a proposed subdivision amendment application to the Elder Single Lot Development submitted by Roy Elder on property located at 10720 Road 43, Mancus, Colorado, consisting of 10.10 .10 acres more or less, located north of Highway 160 and west of Road 44. Situated in Section 23, Township 36 North, Range 13 West, NMPM. The hearing will be held Tuesday, November 2nd, 2021 at 9 a.m. Commissioner's Hearing Room, Montezuma County Administrative Offices, 109 West Main, Cortez, Colorado. Interested persons may attend and give input. Information may be obtained from the Planning Office online service at https co-montezuma-co.smartgovcommunity.com public home. You may also contact the planning department at 970-565-2801 with questions. Dated this 19th day of October, 2021, Kim Purcell, Clerk, Board of County Commissioners, Montezuma County, Colorado, published in the journal on Wednesday, October 20th, 2021. Okay, thank you, Kim. All right, Don, do you want to give us an overview of what we have here? Sure. Uh, Roy, you want to come up? Sure. Mr. Elder is here for uh, his uh, amendment to his single lot development. Off of Road 43, or I guess at the end of Road 43, basically. Um, Roy's looking to uh, expand his 10 acre single lot development to a 12.5 acre single lot development, taking the two and a half acres from his um, adjacent property that adjoins on the west and south and adding it to the south end of his current parcel. The remaining uh, parcel um, will be over 35 acres. So this will still remain a single lot development. It's just gonna be a little larger and be the uh, second amendment. Okay, so um, do, do you have any comments, Mr. Elder? No, I just acquired that extra acreage through a, a fence line agreement with my neighbor so it was a while before we got that done but that's why I'm adding it on to the one parcel where my home is at that I'm going to keep and I still have like he said over a 35 acre parcel that right so you're basically just going to that fence line in other words yes okay all right commissioners any questions comment no it's pretty straightforward no. okay well, at this time, then, I'll open this up for <coughs> public comment. Anybody wishing to speak for or against this application, please come to the podium. You have three minutes to address the commissioners. Public comment is open. 
Okay, seeing none, I will close the public comment session and I will bring it back um, to the commissioners. Gentlemen. Yes, I, I move we approve the uh, Elder single lot development submitted by Roy Elder on property located at 10720 Road 43 Mancus. No, I'll second it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to accept the proposed subdivision amendment application to the Elder single lot development submitted by Roy Elder on property located at 10 720 Road 43 Mancus, Colorado consisting of 10.10 10 acres more or less all those in favor aye 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 and i will close this public hearing and we uh we should have that plat later this morning for you to sign okay if we can get it uh, signed by empire electric okay very good very good thank you very much yep thank you sir have a good day your plat to Empire Electric, the offices are off and on closed. They had a little COVID problem out there. So. Okay. Um, Roy's been in contact with Orly, okay. so I think they might have a, an appointment set up. Good. So, yeah. But thanks for sharing that. Okay. Um, looks like we have a little time done before our next public hearing. So, we do have a couple of mylars to be signed. Um, One's a single lot development for Jimmy Sukla that was approved last week. And the other is to be uh, part of the second public hearing. But you can sign, can sign one. one now. You can sign one now. All right. Roll it out. I'll play you a voicemail later. <laughs> mm. Is it profound? Oh, yeah. our clock at the bottom shack or is that just the date what's that i said our digital clock at the bottom the one on my computer says 909 the one on mine doesn't have, have it it's gone you took it away from us i'm so sorry Cut but backs. that's okay <laughs> cutbacks already yeah, yeah. We're, we're actually going to be cutting back on time a whole hour next week <laughs> We're ready. Are we starting at 9 or are we ending at 4? Yes. <laughs> so it is 9 10 now. And we have another public hearing. So, Kim, would you go ahead and call the roll, please? Commissioner Candelaria. Here. Commissioner Lindsay. Here. Commissioner Stevenson. Here. Administrator Powers. Here. Attorney McLaren. Here. And Kim Purcell, Montezuma County Clerk and Recorder. Notice is hereby given that the Montezuma County Board of County Commissioners will hold a public hearing for review and determination of a proposed hey, single lot development and an ar 10 34 rezoning application submitted by yeah. Carla Fassett, revocable living. Can you take that car outside, please? Agent oh, James Lindahl on property located at 43996 Road in Yeah, Lucas, go ahead Colorado. and read. 
consisting. I'm, I just want to take my call. I'm uh, 55 decibels right now. 60.91 right. acres more or less, located north of Highway 160 and west of Road 44. Situated in Section 11, Township 36 North Range. Kim, go ahead. Kim, go ahead and stop that. Stop. The hearing will be held Tuesday, no. Stop.
Jane, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We had a uh, technical difficulty in the room. We'll be resuming in just a moment. Oh, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Give him just a minute to let him finish that in case somebody does walk over there. That's the first time that's happened? You know, the last year and a half has been pretty uh, abrasive. It's gotten, um, I, I don't even know, you know, people are just really wanting to make their points in a, a disrespectful and and rude manner, and it uh, it doesn't work out. Are we live? Yes. Well, actually, let me just let me just put it this way: there are ways to get things done, and there are ways to get things done right, and there are ways to get things done wrong that usually don't end up too too well for those people. If you're trying to make a point to us, be respectful, come in and make a point, but do it in a logical manner that makes sense. We sit up here, we listen to everything, we listen to both sides, and that's what people have forgotten. And there are two sides to every story, and we have to listen to them both. We are not disrespectful to anybody. When you walk into this room and disrespect us like that, it's probably not going to end well for you or anybody else out there. 
That's absolutely disrespectful and will not be allowed in our Board of County Commissioner's room. If you have a public comment, come in and make a public comment. But do it in the right way and the right manner. It's not going to be accepted any other way. And we listen to both sides. Trust me, we are humans just like you, and we deserve to have a little bit of respect when you walk into this room. So, with that, we are going to uh, Let's restart. We have a disruption, but we're going to go back to our 910 public hearing. And uh, <coughs> as soon as Mr. Haley sits down and takes 30 seconds, then. We will reconvene and we will go to our 910 public hearing. And with that, Kim, I will ask you to recall the roll and we will start from the beginning. Commissioner Candelaria. Here. Commissioner Lindsay. Here. Commissioner Stevenson. Here. Administrator Powers. Here. Attorney McLaren. Here. And Kim Cassell, oh, yeah. Montezuma County Clerk and Recorder. Notice is hereby given that the Montezuma County Board of County Commissioners will hold a public hearing for review and determination of a proposed single lot development an AR 10-34 rezoning application submitted by Carla Fassett Revocable Living Trust, Agent James Lindahl, on property located at 43996 Road M, Mancus, Colorado, consisting of 60.91 acres, more or less, located north of Highway 160 and west of Road 44, situated in Section 11, Township 36 North, Range 13 West, 10 p.m. <coughs> The hearing will be held Tuesday, November 2nd, 2020 at 9, 10 a.m. Commissioner's Hearing Room, Montezuma County Administrative Offices, 109 West Main, Cortez, Colorado. Interested persons may attend and give input. Information may be obtained from the Planning Office online services at https co montezuma cosmartgovcommunitycom public home. You may also contact the Planning Department at 970-565-2801 with questions. Dated this 19th day of October, 2021, Kim Purcell Clerk, Board of County Commissioners, Montezuma County, Colorado, published in the journal on Wednesday, October 20th, 2021. Okay, thank you, Kim. Don, would you go ahead and give us an overview on this one? Sure, and Mr. Uh, <coughs> Jim Lindahl is on Zoom as uh, Miss Facet's agent. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, uh, Miss Facet, um, is looking to split off 10 acres um, with the residences and outbuildings from her 68 acre parcel. Um, she currently has three residents on there. The newest one is from 1961. All three have septic systems. Um, per the land use code, uh, you're no longer grandfathered in and need to become com compliant if developing your property uh, and meet the land use code today's current standards. But um, due to her situation, um, we have recommended that a plat note be added to the Mylar that states if she sells or passes that the one residence be removed, thereby leaving just two residences on that 10 acre parcel. Either that or the buyers would need to go through the permitting process <coughs> to get approved for having three residences on that property. Um, Mr. Lindahl is purchasing the remaining 50 acres and joining it with his property to the north. He has um, the, th the three parcels to the north and he plans to purchase either him or his son the 10 acre parcel in the future if and when it becomes available. He's, he's trying to put that whole big ranch back together that originally existed. Planning and zoning had, uh, they recommended it unanimously for approval and other, it's just basically a single lot development. But that's why there's no access roads or any easements or anything dedicated to the remaining 50 acres because it's adjoined to the north. Okay, and planning had no no issues at all? Mm -mm. Nothing? Hmm. Gentlemen? <coughs> I have no questions. Comment? <coughs> okay. Well, with that then, um, Mr. Lindahl, do you have anything to add to Mr. Haley's comments? 
No, thank you. You've all been wonderful to work with. Thank you very much. All we want to do is farm hay and ride a few horses. Okay. All right. With that, then, I will uh, go ahead and open it up for public comment. Anybody wishing to speak for or against this application, please come forward. State your name and address clearly for the record, and you can address the board. Okay, seeing none, I will close the public comment session and I will bring it back to the commissioners for any um, questions, comments, or recommendations. I have none at this time. <coughs> Either. I would recommend that we approve the single lot development AR 1034 rezoning application submitted by Carla Fassett Re Revocable Living Trust agent Jim Lindell on property located at 43996 Road M, Mancus, Colorado. Second. It's been moved and seconded to accept the proposed single lot development and AR 10 through 34 rezoning application submitted by Carla Fassett, Revocable Living Trust, Agent Jim Lindo on property located at 43996 Road M, Mancus, Colorado, consisting of 60.91 acres more or less. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks to Don and Jane. Appreciate your time today. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Okay, and now we have uh, we're way into our next time zone. So no, we don't have to wait. We don't have to wait at all. We figured out a way to kill time. <laughs> <laughs> We will need to have the Mylar signed, but we can wait until after the next <coughs> public hearing. Okay. <coughs> All right. So um, with that, we'll be at our 920 public hearing. And if that's the case, and Kim, would you go ahead and call the roll, please? Commissioner Candelaria. Here. Commissioner Lindsay. Here. Commissioner Stevenson. Here. Administrator Powers. Here. Attorney McLaren. Here. Kim Purcell, Montezuma County Clerk and Recorder. Notice is hereby given that the Montezuma County Board of County Commissioners will hold a public hearing for a review and determination of a proposed high impact special use permit with a commercial rezoning application submitted by Zane O'Dell on property located at To Be Determined Road X, Lewis, Colorado, consisting of 10 acres more or less, located north of Road X, west of Highway 491, situated in Section 26, Township 38 North, Range 17 West, NMPM. The hearing will be held Tuesday, November 2nd, 2021 at 9.20 a.m. Commissioner's Hearing Room, Montezuma County Administrative Offices, 109 West Main, Cortez, Colorado. Interested persons may attend and give input. Information may be obtained from the Planning Office online service at https co montezuma cosmartgovcommunitycom public home. You may also contact the Planning Department at 970-565-2801 with questions dated this 19th day of October, 2021. Kim Purcell, Clerk, Board of County Commissioners, Montezuma County, Colorado, published in the journal on Wednesday, October 20th, 2021. Thanks, Kim. Uh, Don, Jane? Uh, yes, uh, Okay. Mr. Odell, would you please come up? There he is. So Mr. Odell is looking at um, on his 10 acre parcel just west of 491 uh, north of X. And, um, and Don, I'm just going to stop you for one second. I think we should probably wait till Commissioner Candelaria gets back. Uh -huh. Fair enough. Yep, just to, to move forward. I think that would be in everybody's best interest. Well, that works for me. Five minute break. So, just an update on the co op subdivision that you see right there at uh, Road X and 491. Um, we had some uh, phone calls a couple, three months ago, um, questions about that property. When it was uh, on our GIS map, the easement that runs north of X um, through the middle of that subdivision and uh, uh, west there of the north parcel did not exist. So we uh, did some research on that subdivision uh, the plat, how it was created, and we had that information given to so GIS. 
so we could get that easement platted through that subdivision. Um, so we should it's not dedicated to anybody. It's just a public access easement, but that gives access behind those uh, commercial buildings. All the parcels are, it's a commercial subdivision. They're all uh, commercial properties. But um, that's why if anybody's noticed that now there's a, a, an easement there, I don't believe most of those containers are parked on that easement, but um, that's not really ours to deal with right now. Um, it is a four acre parcel, the fourth, or four lot parcel. The fourth one is actually the frontage road and, and parking area adjacent to 491. Just for anybody's curiosity. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we're dealing with the little situation we had a little while ago. Uh, what we're going to take a ten-minute break. Oh, 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 never mind. They're back. We're back. Boy, time flies when you're having fun. That was a quick ten minutes, wasn't it? <laughs> no, you're good. I just gave them an update on the uh, co-op basin co-op subdivision there in the corner. That 60-foot easement was not depicted on our GIS map. So uh, I had I had one of the property owners. Um, call asking questions and so we got that updated so that 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 easement access behind all of those commercial parcels is now depicted accurately okay so back to mr. Odell and his application um, he is uh, requesting commercial uh, zoning on his 10 acre parcel along with a high impact permit for a new sales barn um, the corrals would be to the north. The, um, I guess the auction building house would be roughly there in the middle um, with a future plan of adding a cafe or restaurant adjacent or, or within those that same perimeter. Um, he is also planning on having two accesses north off of Road X. Um, you can you can kind of see them in the black lines, one in the southeast corner there, um, opposite the driveway to the south, and then the other one would be there to the west, about a third of the way in to the property. That will allow for uh, trucks and trailers bringing in and hauling out um, livestock access, and then the public can come in from the other way and have uh, move, room to move and and not have traffic congestion there. It looks like there's a turning lane off of that northern area, off of the highway too, coming down that um, foot easement, or is that a? No, well, that that is, that's actually lot four of the Basin Co-op subdivision. Oh, gotcha. And um, Mr. Odell right now would not be accessing from from that area. So it all both, off of X. Both driveways would come off of Road X. And it's roughly eight to nine hundred feet west of the highway right away to the first driveway. So it's way out of um C dots oversight. Okay. There are turn lanes there, so that highway section yeah, covers the, the county open. road. Um, so then I'll ask, have you opened it up for public comment? No. Uh, okay. Yeah, we no. Just, we all right. just restarted <coughs> it. We did an update on the yeah. corner there. And okay. Plug all in. right. Thank you. you I appreciate it. Okay, then we'll we'll get going on. Do you have anything else that you'd like to add, Mr. Odell, before we go to public comment? It's, it's just going to be a family-run business. The family's going to build it. It isn't to be resold. I own the ground around it, the farm ground. Uh, you, you thinking that may be in a turn lane, that was when Wilson's farmed that. 
they used his approach to get their wheat truck in and out. That's what those tracks are from when that oh. picture was taken. Uh, we would put up a steel building, steel pins. Uh, we have a sale barn. I think the local people need a more modern way to merchandise their livestock. Right now there's a lot of them leaving this area by the thousands. Uh, maybe I could create it here where they could sell locally. The Navajo trade that comes here, by them going to Yellow Jacket, then they can purchase hay there from the farmers, which they do to some degree now. I think that would open a little of that up. Other than that, I don't have much more to say. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, sir. Um, at this time, then, we will go ahead and open this uh, up for public comment. Um, again, anybody s wishing to speak for or against this application, please come forward, state your name and address for the record, and you may address the board at this time. Okay, seeing none, we'll close the public comment session of this, and I will bring it back to the commissioners. Gentlemen, any no. questions, comments? No. Recommendation? No. Okay. Planning? Recommended? I recommended it now. Okay. Hearing no public comment, I uh, have no questions. I move we accept the rezoning application submitted by Zane O'Dell on property located to be determined at Road X, Lewis, Colorado. I'll second it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to accept a proposed high impact special use permit with commercial rezoning application submitted by Zane O'Dell on property located at TBD Road X, Lewis, Colorado, consisting of 10 acres more or less. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, sir. Thank, Thank you. you guys Have for your time. Day. Yep, and Appreciate I will close it. this uh, public hearing. So all we got is for the facet approved subdivision or single lot development, Mylar to be signed. That was quick. That was quick. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anything else? Ladies and gentlemen. That's all we have unless Ian has any update on, on the glare discussion. I, I, I don't think that's something that we're going to take up at this time. Perfect. So, yeah. Perfect. Fair enough. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Okay, next on our agenda, we have our public comment session. The Board of County Commissioners welcomes you to this meeting. Person speaking during the public comment 
will be limited to three minutes or depending on the number of people wishing to speak. It may be reduced to allow all members of the public the opportunity to address the board. When addressing the board, please state your name and address for the record prior to providing your comments and comments to individual supervisors or staff are not permitted and participants may not yield their time. So with that, we will open public comment. Good morning. James Parks. James Parks, County Road 32 12 976. You all were going to talk to the roads guy about chip sealing L32 and P to connect to 33 last week. I'm wondering if you have any information if we're going to get it done next summer, possibly. Um, this is your this is not a debate. This is your time to comment and we'll address it later in the meeting Okay, so if you're at, uh, looking for answers right now, you're not going to get them. This no. is public comment Okay, well, there's my public comment. Okay. It, it needs to get chips healed. All right. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you Anybody else? Okay, seeing no nobody else to come forward, we're going to close the public comment session of this, and we are going to go on with our meeting. The next up, we have our benefits health um, advisor and our insurance renewals, Jake Zender, and I hope I said that properly. And if the benefits committee wants to come up, you can as well. Good morning. Good morning. run get her done okay um, so a couple of new commissioners on the board um, so what I wanted to do is just kind of run through why we do what we do as far as our health insurance goes so I'm just gonna do a little bit of scribbling here just kind of showing why we're doing what we do so a couple of ways to purchase health insurance one we're all very familiar with which is fully insured insurance Pretty much how that works is we pay premiums and really our main outflow or what we're trying to cover is claims right one big component to fully insure insurance is we have what's called an ACA tax that ACA tax is roughly five percent so if we have insurance rates automatically off the top we're paying five percent tax so what we've done and we did this about seven years ago. Seven, is that right? About seven years ago, we did what's called a partially self-funded plan. And I'll explain a little bit later how this works in detail. But basically with this, we put deposits into an account. And our outflows are spec or specific insurance, aggregate insurance, and a third party administrator. So they're the ones that basically are administer our claims. With this, the ACA came in, or Affordable Care Act came in and said, your claims have to equal 80% of your total dollar spent. So essentially with this, we're paying a dollar to get 80 cents back. Not a great deal. With this, we're paying dollar for dollar on our claims. So we're, retreat, we're retaining roughly 95%. So basically the county dollars are being spent on what they're supposed to, which is claims. 95% worth. So let's talk about these two pieces that we purchase and why we purchase those. Do you remember this presentation from seven years ago? Okay. So, <clears throat> what we have, obviously, 
obviously we have more than five employees on the plan, right? But if I drew out 230 employees, that might take me a minute. So the way this works is any claim up to $60,000 worth funding. After that $60,000, it goes to the insurance, called specific insurance, or spec. But then we have, so let's say this could be up to 500, well, it could be more than that, but like 500,000, let's say. Where here we have an employee that does like 10,000, we have 100, we have maybe somebody that goes to 50, we have another employee that goes up to 300,000. So essentially, this, all this up here, we purchased the insurance to cover our catastrophic claims. Now we have this, which is called aggregate or everyday claims. What this does is it kind of drops into a bucket and it starts filling this bucket with claims. If we ever go over a certain dollar amount, it caps. So in other words, we have two protections in place to where we can we can get an actual hard dollar number. So again, we're capping here and we're capping here. Our hope, and, and it's happened in the past, our hope is that we run at 80% of total claims and we get that money back. So if we did not spend that money, we're actually getting it back in the form of a rebate the next year. <clears throat> what I will say is the challenge, especially this year, is we had quite a few high claimants. So we had a lot of health conditions kind of hit. Our total plan spend was very high. With that being said, and I'll actually, I'll get to that as well. So uh, I have a question. What's yeah. that percentage then, before you get over that 60,000, what is that percentage before that starts moving? You have a percentage on the low side of the bucket at 80%. But what's that gap so, on this side of it? Well, this isn't a percentage. This is a, a dollar stop gap. I understand that. Less. But a deductible. But where where is that? I'm looking at it as a percentage. How many percent of our people are going over that sixty thousand? Um, I would say roughly from a percentage standpoint about twenty percent. Okay. And it's but which very much fits in line with actuary data. They basically say it's the 20% that make up 80% of your cost mm -hmm. from a high claim standpoint. So, so, but we don't have a real quantifiable, that's just an estimate right now, or is it quantifiable as true data for us? No, it's for true our data. Canon? Okay. So one thing that we do receive that we did not receive previous, I, I don't know if you were around when we had CTSI, it was mm -hmm. a pool. At the end of the year, this is kind of what we got from CTSI. We got a graph that basically said 20% of your claims were high. Uh, it, it was basically a bar graph of how your claims worked. We didn't know specific conditions. We didn't know what the, what the total cost was. So basically, the biggest frustration, and I think we can kind of attest to this is we didn't know where those dollars were going we basically had to lean on the fact that they were telling us the truth so with this it's fully transparent we know what the dollar amount is we know what the claims are and so on so it gives us power of data so like if, if we have a high claimant we know hey this person uh, could be going on to COBRA, could be going off the plan, has COBRA currently, COBRA's going to um, expire in, on this date. So we just, we have a lot more knowledge in these renewals. So with that being said, one of the things, and I'll get more in depth on this, but I brought Rick Schrader, CFO of Southwest Memorial Hospital, what we're going to talk a little bit about is strategy going forward. So we are very much tied to our claims, right? Doesn't matter if we're fully insured, doesn't matter if we're partially self-funding, claims is what drives our cost and also our renewals. So with that, Anthem, your incumbent carrier, 
originally came in at 17.9%. That was the rate increase they asked for. Knowing that there's conditions currently and there will be conditions going forward. What we do, our firm, is we take you up to bid to 25 plus carriers. Typical brokerage has four. And what those are, I'll write that out, it's Buka, Blue Cross, United, Cigna, Aetna. Where these come in, they are stop loss carriers that take on that risk that I talked about. So with that, we're getting a full bid to ensure that you're getting the best, the absolute best cost for your conditions and for your plan. So with that, we took these bids and these bids went back to Anthem. Anthem said, yep, we'll revise at 12.9%. <clears throat> Cigna came in and said, we will come in at 3.5% total increase. So due to the bid, Cigna was able to basically really come down on their cost. They want your business. They've had it before, they want it back. A couple of caveats, or I'd say benefits to that. What they're willing to do is do what's called a client-specific network with the hospital. So we talked about we have high claims, correct? How do we get those high claims down? It's cost, right? So with Rick, we can incentivize care to Southwest Memorial. Now when I say incentivize, it's incentivized. And what that means is if you do want to go to Durango, you can go to Durango and you're not going to pay any more than you do today. If you want to utilize Southwest Memorial, you're going to essentially get that reduction in your co-pays, your um, deductibles. So it's incentivized. So people will stay local in order to save dollars. So that's one thing that they said. It takes Cigna about six months to put it together. So we're, shoot, we're shooting for 2023, January of 2023 to institute this. <clears throat> they also have said the highest that they will go for a renewal next year is 8% the absolute highest. Since, since we've been your broker, your average renewal has been 4% over the last six years, now seven. Typical, typical increase that we see, so industry standard, is about 15. So one thing that we're also trying to do by being partially self-funded Thanks for grabbing this, by the way, Shaq. Word. Word. <laughs> so here's our 15% curve, right? Obviously, we've been in this 4%, and really due to the bid is really what it's been, because we go to carriers and we say, hey, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. But we're at this 4%, but by being partially self-funded, if we're getting money back at the end of the year, so our trend is going like this, partially because A, we have had rebates in the past or surplus money coming back. So our costs are basically staying in this realm versus this 15% industry standard. Clear as mud? I got it. <clears throat> so long and the short of it, um, is that we basically negotiated it down to 3.5% versus 12.9, or I should say 17.9 to start with. So it's a 3.5 total percent increase. What's, it, what's coverage? Rick, is Rick would, you, would you like to add anything to the incentivized care piece? Yeah, I mean, one of the things, Jim. Come on, uh, come on up, Rick, please. Sorry. I, I need you to use a mic, mic. Okay. and it's not specifically for us in the room. It's specifically sure. for the people Absolutely. on TV. 
you told me not to stay away from the TV cameras as much as I could. <laughs> so I was trying to listen to your directive commission. But um, a couple of things that we talked about uh, when we met back in the uh, city chamber halls was looking to try to see how Southwest Health Systems could kind of help reduce the cost and kind of share some of that burden. So uh, we spoke with uh, Jake and Brian uh, regarding this and, and Jim, I know you and I, I'm sorry, Commissioner, you and I have had a discussion about this as well. So we were figuring, hey, how can we, how can we help out the county who's helped out us as well as help out some of the folks that work for the county and are dependent on the county for, for insurance. So we came up with a, a way to kind of you know, lower co-pays from out of pocket as well as kind of save the county some money with, uh, with some direct contracting options. And that's where we kind of put our heads together with Jake to bring this proposal to you guys. Okay. And just as a background, we work directly with the hospital as well and are doing this in their facility. Yeah. Okay. And, and just so the commissioners know, what he's referencing to um, about a year ago, year and a half ago. Yeah, it was right before COVID. Right before right. COVID, we yep. were presented with a, uh, I can't even remember the name. It of was Peak. What was it? I was Peak's proposal. Peak. Peak. Somebody from Durango came yeah. and, and spoke. And was, was trying to get something started with the insurances with the, that they were doing in La Plata right. County, basically. And COVID hit and everything kind of went. So, wherever, uh, wherever got back burner. Yeah. Um, so that was one of the questions that the current commission was asking at that time is why don't, why don't we utilize our own, our own health care? Now, obviously, people have choices and they can go to Durango or go anywhere they want to go, but um, to help make it more affordable for our own people here locally, you know, does that work? And that's part of the conversations that, that Rick and I have had. How do we help our own people yeah. uh, in our own community? So Peak actually started a lot of that conversation with those uh, presentations right. that they were right. doing. But they also wanted to incentivize care to travel. Correct, because right. there, there's also a cost to travel. Yeah. So, um, so the recommendation of the benefits committee is that we do go with the switch to Cigna and take the three and a half percent increase over the 12.9 percent increase. Um, does anybody on the benefits committee have anything they want to add? So I'm going to ask you all because the minute we switched last time, uh, I mean, have you asked the employees because we're, we, we have to look at the math too. But the employees, the last time we switched, we had a cost savings, I believe it was. Um, yeah, we uh, no, you're, you're thinking two times before. Was it, was it two times before? Anyway. Yeah. United, yeah, and we were not happy with that. People Correct. Happy with United, so but we've had Cigna before. And okay. As far as I know, everybody's okay with it. And, and the dental and vision are staying the same. Staying Correct. The same. And, and um, just as a little, uh, I guess, addition to that, so when we had Cigna, uh, about three years ago, for about three years, there were kind of pieces to the puzzle missing, and we basically were able to contract different providers that did not have the Cigna network. So we've actually built an, a, 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 an expansion of that Cigna network out here. So it's going to be so we know kind of what the network's going to look like already. So it was Benefit Health Advisor and Cigna that went to these doctors and said, you know, we need you in network. Which, which I guess that, that's from where we're sitting, you know, looking at 3.5% or 12.9%. Yeah, it's not much it's of a decision. It's not much of a decision. Yeah. I mean, right. it, it's, it's pretty <clears throat> difficult from where we're sitting. That equates to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, um, and that's what we discussed as a benefits committee yesterday was and the feedback coming from my office was if we could find, you know, with Cigna coming in at the 3.5 renewal rate, that maybe that would help as far as with our dependent care coverage and trying to bolster that. You know, if we can save money on a renewal rate, that may help us in, in that. Method. That was the feedback I got from my office as far as switching care. Okay. What about uh, coverages? We looking at the same kind of coverage? Same. Okay. We haven't changed, <clears throat> excuse me, we haven't changed the plan in probably 15 years. We did look at doing that, um, but the cost differential from plan to plan was so minute that it just didn't make sense. 
because we did look at doing a much higher deductible option. Mm -hmm. um, forgive me if I'm wrong, but it was about a 10% decrement. I think it was going to raise our, yeah, that's going to raise the premium. So it was about a 10% difference in swing, which for, and we're talking for bare bones coverage. Um, so it really didn't make, make a, a ton of sense. So I think really our strategy going forward is let's try to, let's try to manage costs. So we, we've talked a little bit about bolstering the wellness committee a little bit, starting to do some incentives for employees, you know, having contests, giving away prizes, um, just encouraging healthy behavior. So that's one way we're trying to address the claims. The other is obviously working with Rick at the hospital and building that network out to where we can utilize the local facility, which strengthens us as a community. And then also um, cl just having claims, lower claims that help our spend. Because we are funding these claims up to a certain mm -hmm. amount. So it's our dollars. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Okay, I, I think it makes fiscal sense with taxpayer dollars that going with a 3.5% renewal, it saves us about a quarter million dollars. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how you argue with that. You, uh, yeah, well, we, can, we can't, we can't, can't argue even, that. Yeah. I mean, it's that, that percentage is, those are real numbers. And although I think it's bizarre, you know, we, we, everybody uses the term affordable health insurance, I, I think that should not even be out there because there is no such a thing as affordable when they talk about health insurance, and that's just my opinion. And I'm expressing it because I, I see people all the time, you know, what's affordable to you may not be affordable to anybody else or vice versa. So it's really, th that, that term is used broadly and loosely and it shouldn't be. Um, and, and when they can get increases, even 12.9% and the industry standard is 15% yeah. per annum, that's, that's not right. Oh, that's agree. ridiculous. So my question is, how much are they, how much are they billion dollar companies per year? They probably are. These I don't know that. Companies? Absolutely. So I, I get th it. that's what, it, it's just, I, I understand that it is a philosophical and, conversation and, and I'm not here to yeah. do that. This is why However, I do what I do. We, this is why we, I do what I do. Two we don't one. have much of a choice. I, I can't. In a I can't look at three point five percent and spend twelve point nine percent. Right. Well, not with that attitude. <laughs> Correct, and that is my attitude. So. Well, you know what bothers me the most is we pay national costs, but we live out here in a depressed rural area, and are expected to pay what communities that you know the standard of living is twice what it is here. Right. But that's okay. I think with with hopefully teaming up with, with the hospital and, and working together as a community, we can make something that's better and beneficial to all and, and because they're part of our community also. So Absolutely. we're trying to look at a, a bigger, mm -hmm. broader picture and, here. And so I don't Chairman, uh, Ms. Billy put together, she was not here yesterday, but she put together a spreadsheet for us to look at this morning. And okay. um, I'll put it up on the screen, but I might need her to explain it because I haven't had time to go over it yet. I, I guess one note I also want to add is that um, as benefit health advisor, if you get an increase, that doesn't mean we get an increase in pay. So what Correct. we do is we, our fee is a per employee per month basis. So if you guys grow, we grow. Mm -hmm. If you shrink, we shrink. But these percentages that they, that they increase on us, it, it's, it, Essentially, it's not helping us either. No, I, I, I totally understand that. And I appreciate the work that you're doing for us. I, I, I realize that you're not caught in the middle. Yeah, you're, you're the middle guy. I, I, um, just being transparent, I work my butt off for you guys every and, single year. And I appreciate that. However, like I said, that we were going to get into a philosophical and, conversation. And, and I can verify, time. when I first met Jake six or seven years ago, he came in about 425, easy. He's been working it off. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Billy, do you okay, want to come to the mic and kind of explain what we've got here? <clears throat> and, and make sure the mic's on. Yep. 
Okay, so the. So you have to stay that close to the mic. You can't move away from it. <laughs> oh, sorry. <coughs> Stuck. Um, the first, uh, actually, the second column there, it says uh, OAP choice. So these amounts are the amounts that the company is going to charge us the 876.43, the 1840. You see all that? So the county always funds at a thousand so the numbers we use is what the thousand dollar um, deductible amount is which is eight eleven forty eight which actually is down from last year's premium from what the county is paying because we're paying this year eight thirty nine thirty three and if the it, Cigna's gonna charge us eight eleven forty eight a month for our thousand dollars so that part went down which made of course dependent coverage to go up and the fact that the high deductible health plan where the county gives um, the employee an HSA amount actually went down significantly too and this is a formula we use when we put the numbers in that's just the way it comes out any of it make sense so where it says 22 22 2022 20, monthly that's what the insurance company's going to charge us we're going to pay 8 11 48 and then that leaves these amounts over here for the employee to pay and I can tell you the HSA for one dependent went up from 4.43 to 6.08 a month. So the only way to, in my mind, the only way to fix that is we pay more, but that's totally up to you guys on what the county actually pays per employee to take away from dependent coverage because there's no other way. Okay. So my question to you, Shaq, then we don't have to make a decision on this today, but you need it by when next week? <coughs> or it, Two different things. Um, there's two different decisions to be made. One, obviously, is do you go with the 12.9 or the 3.5? Right, I, I don't think that'll take uh, that's much. But um, another is decision is do we keep paying what we've been paying and allow the rest of that to spill over to dependent <coughs> care I think is what Miss Billy is suggesting uh, or not and that would be for us to just uh, chip in what we've already been paying um, and so n I need a decision on <laughs> that we decided to vote on the, on the budget 7th. December 7th so no less than three weeks prior because I have to public notice the budget and have it available for two weeks prior. So I, I'm, I think we're, we can probably give a decision on the carrier today. Right. The right. gentlemen are fine. But I think this is, a, this is the second part of the conversation that needs to be had prior to making the decision on this. Um, So can we put more of a discussion on this in our work session for Monday? Absolutely. Can you guys all be here Monday? Okay. Well, I, I understand that, right. Jake, but no, we don't I'm want talking to the benefits committee. <laughs> you haven't seen the way I run Zoom? <coughs> <laughs> don't say a word. <laughs> you don't want to see the way you run Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, okay, we'll, we'll put uh, this with the benefits committee on for Monday. At 1.30? And generally, well, I guess it, it'll be after 1.30 because That's we have um, access at 1.30. Just somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. not time limits aren't. Jack, I can zoom in if you'd like me to. Okay. should be able to. Okay. Okay, gentlemen, then we have only one decision to make today, and I think it's pretty, yeah. pretty easy. Make a motion we switch our health insurance to Cigna. I'll second it. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded to switch the county insurance carrier to Cigna uh, from Anthem at the 
3.5% increase that we currently uh, achieve. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And, and I do want to make one minor correction to what I said. I need three weeks prior to voting on the budget. However, I didn't take into consideration what Miss Billy needs for open enrollment and what the employees need for decision making. I need everybody time. signed up by the 29th of November because I have to get everything in the computer before the next payroll or the first payroll in December. You'll, you'll have a decision so, next yeah, Tuesday. We just yeah. I would just like to look at this a little official. bit more in depth from what you yeah, guys Yeah, I just need the numbers, final numbers. Yeah. Trying to present to us, yep. I mean, before we make that final decision. Okay. Because dollars and cents are, are what we're looking at. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jake. I appreciate your time. Thank you, guys. Appreciate Unless, it. Thanks, I'm Tyson. sorry. Do you guys have anything to add? I apologize. No, nope. I look forward to our meeting on Monday. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Nothing broke in my session. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Kick, Thank you. kick it over as you leave. <laughs> Okay, uh, moving on. We have Road and Bridge next, Mr. Englehart. <laughs> you usually a lot of help. Good morning. Good morning. So, uh, let's start with the maybe the November activity schedule, please. So, on the screen there, uh, we are currently building that new road across Road 20 crossing there that uh, we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, and it's going real well. Um, hopefully, I don't see any reason unless bad weather kicks in or whatever, we shouldn't have that pretty much ready to gravel and maybe even gravel by the end of this schedule by the 12th uh, uh, the middle of the month the way things are moving so that's that's going real well we are also uh, working down in road g that thing has really grown up this year with uh, with uh, trees and and fence line brush and different things rabbit brush so we've got the mower down there uh, this week and next week actually i'm sorry road 20 be by the 19th will be done uh, hunting seasons in there of course and then uh, we're also doing some blade shoulder roads and thanksgiving so it's uh, kind of a busy month with uh, guys being off a lot and also a lot of work to do so that's basically our activities for the month of november um, any questions on that okay so uh dola we were accepted for consideration. We have been getting correspondences back now from DOLA for that Road Y16, uh, Road S work next year. Uh, again, that's just consideration. We've got questions and answers this Wednesday at 1 o'clock on Zoom with the people from DOLA to answer a lot of their questions. These are the technical stuff. So uh, I think our application still looks promising, and I think we're moving forward with that. And uh, we've got one of the questions, though, is do you anticipate higher costs of, of materials? And we did get... Uh, uh, reports back from uh, Four Corners that prices are going up 8% on uh, gravels, 6% on asphalt, depending on price of oil. And so everything we do now is going up, 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 sticking up. So the budget we presented last month may be cut way back on work activities due to just price increases. So we are looking at that. And that's a good fair question from Dola because all their applications are based on last year's numbers. And of course, here we go with this inflationary era we're in right now and see where it all heads so so that's what's going on with that uh the McCamel slip i uh, was happy to finally report we finally think we have uh we will not think we do have a plan there it's an embankment plan the engineers are ready to sign off on it uh we're working on final quantities for this plan and i plan on having it ready to go uh, in front of you guys probably next week maybe on one of the work sessions or the week after that it'll be a powerpoint presentation which we will take to the tribe and let them review it too through their council sometime in December. Uh, sent Bernadette a note this morning telling her where we were at with that, and they were happy to hear that we'd be ready to present in December sometime. In the meantime, we'll be working on what looks like our general number 37 Corps of Engineer permit to work in the creek there. 
that seems to be the one that will work the best for us to give us uh, different avenues to go in case we hit something we didn't anticipate seeing. We'd be able to flip over and go that way easier through the permitting system rather than uh, the National 404 that we generally would work under. Uh, we do have to meet some requirements down there, and we sent survey in uh, last Friday to get us some numbers on some elevations and some widths, and I, I don't see a reason why that will interfere with us. It should allow us to use that 37, which is good for us. So, so is the 404 through the Army Corps? Yes, that, well, Army Corps, yes, sir. So we won't have to deal with No, it, they're both. They're both. They're, the the Army Corps offers a 37 or a 404. Okay. A 404 is a little more restrictive under certain terms, and a 37 a little more liberal with us on the others, and I think we meet to 37. So okay. what it gives us is, a, is the ability to, if we hit something we didn't anticipate on a 404, we'd have to stop and start all over again. But with this, we can flex our way through these uh, issues that we don't see, these hidden issues. So, so we had that meeting yesterday with the Corps of Engineers. We were able to set up a 30-minute Zoom with them, and I think we're, we're well on our way with that bunch. And then uh, we were going to have to make some uh, materials out of McCamel Pit, so I got with Randy last week and we started tearing the crusher down at Hay Camp and we're moving to McCamel. It's a basically it's a two inch crushed stone with some fines removed of it. It's a drainage type material mm -hmm. to establish a place for the water to drain through easier and then pushing. So there's going to be quite a bit of that material we'll have to make. Now I'm not talking hundreds of thousands, maybe 30,000 tons, something to that effect and uh, working our way through that. So that'll be the next big push to get him down there and get started making materials once we get the quantities. So. So I, I hope that we can still start that this winter. I don't know we can't. It's, it's moved a little bit with some of the summer rains. Uh, the flash flooding that we saw down the canyon did erode some of that bank and made it move again, but minimal. And uh, the wells are still dropping. Even after the irrigation season, the wells have went down a couple of inches. So uh, we're still positive on that. So that's, that's, that's the good news there. Um, Alkali Creek, the bridge, uh, right away acquisitions are done. We now own that little strip of land we needed there to build that bridge under the federal guidelines. Um, the environmental work is completed. Uh, there was some issues with some wetlands there that got resolved, and so that's all been signed off on now. So uh, talking to Bechtel, we're working on getting a bid proposal out by the end of December, put that bridge up for bid, and we would like to be trying to start that construction sometime around the 1st of May. So, you know, as time goes by in the next two months, I'll be bringing more information to you, schedules and uh, different things that are going on with that. Um, we will ask what procedure they want to use on that bidding, and they obviously want to look at our county acquisition procedures, also CDOTs, but it's pretty much standard uh, bid, bid item stuff that we would put out on the open market, so see what we go with it. So Just pretty much like uh, Mancus did with their CDOT bridge, so. Uh, general road work for this month, uh, again, right now we're doing our seasonal roads in the Mancus Dolores. We did finish up the Forest Service. It's all completed with our Schedule A agreements, and it is well over 100 miles. I thought it was, and it is. So that's done. Uh, we're working on Road 41, 35.6, 35.9, Road N, Road S, all these other outlying twice-a-year roads that need work. Uh, we're hauling in some gravels in different places, fixing mud holes and blading up and getting ready for the winter, and so all that work will be completed in the next couple of weeks. Uh, mag roads uh, with all this rain we see all over the county from one end to the other some issues with mag roads so we're going back and starting to work on that next week uh, rubbing out some of the bad spots you know mag is great when it's dry and it falls apart when it's wet so pick your poison <laughs> you know it's nice to have the rain but it sure isn't good for the mag roads so we're going to try to get those cleaned up before winter hits and have those at least travelable and uh, We'll keep working on this overgrowth with this new mower we've got. It's doing a nice job. It's cleaning things up and does a nice job. So we just keep working on roads that we see need some vision improvements. So working on that. Other than that, that's about it. So any questions? Okay. I, I do have a question, and I see Mr. Parks has stayed in the back of the room, so I want to somewhat address that for him. Okay. Um, I did have the conversation with you last week, and we were talking about um, L... L to anyway all the way up to P um, and and we both drove the road and um, talked about traffic counts the traffic counts are actually very minimal on that road uh, I think you said Rob they were less than 130 or no they're like their latest, latest one I have is 232 a day 230 yeah uh, versus which, like which 600 on low. road 29 however you know. there are that first probably quarter of a mile three-eighths of a mile there that we saw mm -hmm. the road washing on the on the shoulder shoulders um so um 
you know that that I think what he was just expressing is that those are going to get cleaned up. That is part of a magged road, mm -hmm. and that that will be addressed. Hopefully, if the weather stands um, fast right now, well, we want to get it done good. before it snows. Yeah, we will get up there and get, get that, that repaired. Mm -hmm. um, so, anything else you want to add to that? The rest of the road is actually is in pretty decent shape in my opinion. I mean, like I said, I went out there and um, you know looked at it. I know you went out and looked at it. Um, there are some issues with it, obviously, and the and the lower section where it drops off of the yeah. um, the current chip sill or asphalt. That's probably the worst section of that road, probably a half a mile, maybe quarter. Oh, of a there's mile there's potholes up there, but, but that's the worst part. There are potholes mm -hmm. which we will address and get mm -hmm. fixed. So yep. um, anyway, that that is to address you, Mr. Parks. Um, with that, I don't have anything else, gentlemen. I don't. Okay. Good. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. See you in a month. All right. Next, we have we'll be going to Zoom, so I'll have to watch the screen here. We have uh, our noxious weed presentation from Miss Loving, our department head. Jack, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Can't see you. Can you can enable you. my screen sharing abilities? Uh, yes, we can. <laughs> uh. <laughs> There's only county operations pops up. Okay, you should be able to be the host and share your screen. Okay. Can you guys hear me okay? I'm yeah. sorry, what? Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine. It says my internet is unstable, so we'll see. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So I'm just going to give you a kind of a recap of 2021. What I'm going to go through is um, some noxious weed inventory, our local A-list species information, um, information about our phreatophyte project, our Mancus River project, our Hermana project, spotted knapweed and diffuse knapweed project, our cost share program, notifications and enforcement information, and then some education stuff. So here's the map of our noxious weed inventory. The red, um, the red polygons are the weed inventory that I've done from 2020 to 2021. Our green polygons are, is our all-time noxious weed populations from when I started mapping in 2015. So we are seeing a decrease. Here's some statistics that you guys can go through if you're interested. Um, I don't completely map every part of the county every year, so the numbers are going to be different. So that's why I like to combine different years. And then I dissolve any overlapping noxious weed populations so we can get an accurate acreage. So you'll see the estimated total acreage in Montezuma County. That's just kind of with my expertise and what I see. And that's my estimates for what we have across the entire county, including you know, land on the tribe, on the Forest Service, and the BLM. So if you guys just kind of want to take a look at that whenever you get a chance, I'll probably post it on Facebook if anybody's interested. Uh, some of these I don't map just because they're C-list species. Um, and again, C-list is kind of the lower list of plants that are pretty common. And so they're not a very big, big priority Right now, we're really prioritizing management of the A and B list plants. And then some species like the hound's tongue, the bull thistle, they're pretty hard to map. Even though they're on list Bs, you find them a lot in oak. 
and so I don't have good inventory of those guys. Um, the percent of overlap means you'll have a lot of areas where you're going to have multiple noxious weed species. And so this is saying that 34% of my data has overlapping weed species for whatever it's worth. Okay, some A-list species, and to recap, the A-list um, are plants that the state requires eradication on. And pretty much the A-list species are all noxious weeds, but we don't have a big population, so there's a chance that we can actually eradicate it compared to those C-list species like cheatgrass, which is pretty widespread. So our A-lists are pretty much our, our priority species. Um, local governing agencies have the authority to raise a species from a lower list to a higher list, but we can't do vice versa. So pretty much these are, these are our priorities in Montezuma County. So leafy spurge, um, this year we actually found four new populations of it, which is concerning. Um, three of them were treated one of them is located within the Dolores city limits, so I didn't have authority to enforce that, but I am working with the town of Dolores to get their noxious weeds under control and come up with a plan. Uh, the other six known populations were all monitored and treated. My goal remains that I will have this species eradicated by 2025. Mediterranean sage is on the state A list. There were a few rosettes removed um, I really think that we'll be able to eradicate this one as well by 2025. Spotted knapweed, since 2015, we've mapped a total of 206 acres infested. Today we're down to about 100 acres. And then all but two known populations have been treated in 2021 with rejuvra, which is that really good pre-emergent to help control the seed. Um, the other populations were treated last year with rejuvra. So it's really nice that everybody's coming on board to move towards the eradication of spotted knapweed. My goal is still 2025, so we'll see what happens. Diffuse knapweed, um, we've treated about 240 acres. I mean, no, we haven't treated. We've mapped 240 acres since 2015. Right now we're down to 100 acres. We're actively treating about 75% of those populations. The remaining 25%, um, it's located in a lot of private properties, which are pretty remote. It's hard for me to map unless I get permission from those landowners. So that's something we're trying to work on is getting in communication with those landowners and trying to get a management plan and a good inventory. So I've extended this goal from 2025 to 2030 just because these populations in the remote areas, uh, I don't have a good handle on yet. Myrtle spurge, that's on the state A list. Unfortunately, it's not listed as a noxious weed in New Mexico, so they can legally sell it. I found it at Home Depot and Lowe's, which is problematic because people from Cortez are going there and purchasing it and then planting it in their landscapes. So we're trying to do a lot of education to the landscapers um, I'm trying to work with our Colorado Department of Agriculture to work with New Mexico to at least get it on their C list so it's illegal to sell over there. Um, but that's a working progress. A majority of our Myrtle Spurge populations are within the city of Cortez, just planted in people's gardens. The city of Cortez code enforcement has done a really good job about notifying those landowners and getting it eradicated. Um, so my goal still remains that we will have that er eradicated from our county in 2025. Black henbane, you see this a lot in La Plata County. It's a pretty poisonous plant. I've only found it on two properties in Montezuma County, and I really think it came in on hay. But both the landowners have actively been managing it. I didn't get there this year, but I'll follow up next year to see what the populations look like. Um, since it's only on this one little area, I really think we can eradicate it pretty soon. The cut leaf teasel, it's found in two places. It's found mainly down Hartman Draw between County Road P and M, but it's also found on a little drainage on BLM land off of 34. 
And I, we treated that a few years ago and I haven't seen it come back. So I'm hoping it was eradicated on that little section, but we're still working with the landowners to eradicate it down Hartman draw. And because it's hard for me to see from public right away, I have to get permission from the landowners to monitor those populations. So it's just going to take a little bit longer to really get it under control. So I extended that eradication estimate to 2030. Common TESOL, we only have one small population within Cortez city limits. Um, it's being monitored and removed. So hopefully we won't see that species in our county by 2025. We got yellow toad flax, um, all known populations were treated this year and our estimation remains 2025. I think we only have like two or three acres of this species in Montezuma County. It's all pretty much located on Mancus Hill um, on BLM and private properties, but everybody's working together to get this eradicated. Common tansy, it looks a lot like um, yarrow, and we don't have a much of it. I've seen it in some areas in Dolores within the city limits, and then some areas in Mancus, mainly along the county right away. So we're working on eradicating that. Um, estimated eradication is 2025. All right. Can you guys still hear me okay? Yes. Okay, cool. This is our phreatophyte map. Um, the green polygons show our infestations across the county. Those are all known populations that I mapped off satellite imagery, which is pretty accurate. The red polygons are areas that we removed the phreatophytes since 2019. So, so far we've removed it on 332 acres. We have saved um, 370 acre feet of water, you know, after the initial removal. But if we, if we take care of, um, if we remove phreatophytes one year, that water savings is gonna be rolled over into the next year because if we didn't remove those phreatophytes, they would be consuming that same water the next year. So if we accumulate those water savings, we are at 767 acre feet since this project has started. This year we treated about 5,500 sprouts. Um, we've removed in total 48,000 trees. We still have about 27 properties on our wait list. Um, I'm currently working with NRCS on the RCPP agreement. Um, we're probably gonna be opening those applications for eligibility pretty soon and so this program will be in action next year to help reimburse some landowners which is good so as far as future funding um, we got the rcpp the agreement is around 40 to fifty thousand dollars each year one stipulation of this agreement is that the landowners do not have to use our crew they can hire whatever contractor they want However, more than likely, they will utilize our crew because we're going to be the cheapest. Um, NRCS will reimburse them a fixed rate per acre for the removal of the phreatophytes, but in reality, it's not going to cover a whole lot of the cost of an actual treatment by a legit contractor. So it's in their best interest to just use our crew, um, so they'll have to, so they won't have to pay as much. Um, I'm applying for the Colorado Department of Ag Noxious Weed Funds to support the project. Um, it's always a one-year grant, so I'll probably apply for another $40,000. i have applied for the CDA Drought Stimulus Grant. You still there? Unstable. So, much for one. so she's still connected. Nope, she disappeared. Uh, oh, she's back. Oh, I lost you. Yep, you'll have to reshare your screen. Okay, you need to enable my screen sharing. Where did you guys last hear me at? The last slide. The future funding? Yes. You were on number three, the CDA grant. 
CDA grant. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be applying for the CDA grant, the Noxious Weed grant that I apply for every year. They've been supporting this project since it started, so I'll be applying for probably another 40000 um, for 2022. I applied for a CDA drought stimulus grant. I should be hearing back in the next week um, if we were awarded anything. I applied for a Restore Colorado grant through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. It's a three-year grant period. Probably won't hear back until next April. Um, I just applied for a grant improving habitat quality through the National Fish and Wildlife Fund. It's another three-year grant. And I'm applying for a Water Smart Environmental Grant, which you guys know about. Um, it's a three-year grant period. The grant closes in December and probably won't award anything again till probably next April. And I'm still actively looking for some more funding. I've been working with Rachel and all these grants. She's great. She'll look over it, make sure I'm doing a decent job applying. Okay, so the goal of additional funding for this project, I mean, these are big goals, but who knows? I wanna try to purchase an additional excavator through the funding. Um, it would be nice to have Two, that way we can be more efficient with their time. If one breaks down, we can still use the other. If one gets stuck, we can use the other to get the other unstuck. Uh, I want to purchase two additional mulcher attachments that goes on the excavator. Um, we've had a lot of downtime with our mulcher attachment because it does take a lot of brunt force. Um, it's constantly breaking, so it would be nice to have a spare. Um, and then another one, if we do purchase an excavator, we can use it on that. I would like to purchase a Werner wood chipper. We're having some issues with landowners not following up on, on their responsibility to burn or remove the slash piles. So this would eliminate that issue. We've also seen that the chips and the wood strips are actually very good for the soil health. Um, so even, you know, the wood chips would do better than burning the piles for the soil health. Ultimately, I would like to have four employees, um, three of them, 10 month seasons, one 12 month season. I need some funding for herbicide, for the maintenance costs, fuel, PPE. And then I talked to Cortez Fire and they, they actually brought it up that they could help us burn some areas, burn piles, maybe burn section, sections of drainages that are too hard for our equipment to access. So we might collaborate with them in the future. So in a perfect world, if I have all that funding, if I'm able to do what I just told you, I really think that we could get three times more acres treated per year. Um, the extra equipment means less downtime, additional crew members means more work completed. Um, I am anticipating that we'll have had 1,000 acres treated by the end of 2024 if I can be fully funded. The estimated water savings will be around 3,000 acre feet. Okay, so the Mancus River project, it started in 2018. We treated 260 acres of Russian napweed, 2018. You can see on the map to the right, um, those have the different years and how much was treated. The pink ones are 2018 treatments, the yellow 2019, purple 2020, Blue is 2021, and then the light blue is reseeding that was done in 2021. But anyways, um, we treated 800 acres in 2019, 2020, we treated 251. This year we treated about 300 acres and reseeded 150 acres. Our funding sources and partners have been the CDA, Parks and Wildlife, the BLM, Mesa Verde National Park, and then our noxious weed cost share has contributed. So it's looking really good in that area. Um, we're gonna continue this project because it's gonna be long-term to restore that land from Russian nap weed. The Hermana project is a new project. This is kind of a hot spot area with Russian nap weed. Um, it's east of 491, south of S, north of P, and then west of 25, this whole section you know, is over a thousand acres of Russian knapweed. There are large tracts of land, so there's only like, there's less than 10 landowners um, 
with the, the knapweed infestation. So we're trying to help them out, get some funding to get that stuff or reduced. Um, we got funds from the Parks of Wildlife, um, Parks and Wildlife to support this project. So, so far this year, we've got 57 acres treated within this area of Russian knapweed. In the spring, we'll continue some more treatments. Uh, the next new project is a spotted knapweed and diffuse knapweed project. Um, we're trying to help <clears throat> with the landowners. We're going to pay 75% of the treatment costs just so we can work towards our eradication goals. Um, this is another one that was funded through the Parks and Wildlife. Um, so these, we did some treatment this year. The Dolores, town of Dolores treated across from the public land offices, all that spotted knapweed over there. And then in the spring, we'll continue with more treatments. We are using the pre-emergent for all spotted and diffuse knapweed treatments because these guys are reproducing by seed. Um, so we really need to control that seed bank in order to um, hopefully get this eradicated. Our cost share program, this is... This is when I made this PowerPoint, we had 227 general application, nine low income applicants. We've reimbursed about 35,700. Can you guys still hear me? You, yeah, you're in and out, but we can hear you right now. Can you still hear me? Yes, you're in and out. Yeah, it's. I'm unstable. Okay, I'm gonna try and hurry. I've been told. So, <laughs> Glad you said that. Do you have my PowerPoint? At least you guys can see that if you can't hear. Yes, they do, and I sent it to them on Friday. So much for body. I the I do and send it um Friday. Hear me now. Bonnie, I think we're gonna let you off the hook. You have an unstable connectivity problem and uh, we, we do have it so um, we're gonna go ahead and move on so thank you and I appreciate it if you can hear us so with that Mel let's go ahead and bring up the landfill and and we'll get moving on and I'm calling you Shaq on the phone okay go ahead you want to just finish it for me, or should I like do it another day? Um, they've got the PowerPoint, and uh, I think the only thing that they need to really get to is amending the budget. The right, and I'm pulling that up now. So okay. You want to just go over that with them? I will. Work? Yeah, I'll finish that during my report. They've called Mel up. Yeah, I saw that. <clears throat> okay. Okay, I tried. Roger that. <laughs> Bye. Later. Morning. Good morning, Mel. So the scale's in. Uh, um, we'll put it into use as soon as we get the platform where it's safe. We have that hole between the scale and the building. I don't want anybody falling in that. So as soon as we get that placed, then we'll open that out to the public and commercial traffic. Trying to have it this week, but most of my crew is gone. I got two in Denver. Uh, Jose's still out probably for at least another month. So it's about four months for him. Um, that picture right there shows the mud underneath the scale that we could not ever get to to clean out. The load cells were actually encased in mud on the east side. That's how bad that thing was. And there's, I didn't send you all the pictures, but there's some others. There are flakes of metal this big that was coming off the bottom of that scale that was probably eighth to a quarter of an inch thick. So it was fixing to bust through. That's how bad that scale was getting. The only thing holding it up was the compacted mud underneath. Pretty much, at least on the east side. <laughs> so the commissioners, I think Chairman Candelari is aware, but so the other commissioners are aware what had happened was when this originally was put in they installed 
an above ground scale into a pit with no access to at least two load cells is the long Four and the short load of cells. It. Four. So the whole so east side load cells you couldn't get to. Well, you could kind of get to the north and south one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of. It took some doing, but it could be done. Yeah, we were very fortunate when the one load cell on the east side quit that the fire department decided to do a little training exercise with airbag, and we actually got that one fixed. But it was it's, this was a project that was long overdue, and now it's done. The scale looks good. Uh, the ramps uh, are in good shape. And as you can see in that picture, we're going to get that hole filled in before we let people in there. Um, Ed, I can't pronounce his last name, our new paramedic from CDPHE came and took a tour of the landfill about two weeks ago. So he's up on everything that we do down there. He's familiar with where everything's at so we can get moving on the Carver Field Project and our Household Hazardous Waste Project. Shipping out quite a bit of cardboard, uh, according to our broker this time of year, like everything, commodities are going down. So, but on the second page, Shaq, you can, the next one, right there, we sent out, well, we got received $4,000 for cardboard and $3,000 for office paper, and uh, last week in the middle of all this stuff, we sent out a load of number one plastics to Georgia, so we'll see what we get on that. Number twos are going to be a while. It takes about a year for us to get a load of number twos. But other than that, everything's going good. Just shorthand and trying to get too much done at the moment. Very good. So what do we need to do, I mean, to get that filled? I realize you're shorthanded, but that actually is a pretty big hole. Um, well, we're we using the, the, okay, on the, when they pulled out the old scale, uh, Shaq's familiar with it, on the west side there was, the yellow steel plates mm -hmm. and we're going to move them to this side to the east side and uh, hopefully we're going to start laying them this afternoon uh, we as soon as those people were out of the way uh, Mike started working on that Friday the rail that was holding it up on the west side of course because of the slope was too tall so we have to cut all them off remeasure recut them re-weld them and we're going to try and place that this afternoon Okay. But that metal is so rusted and stuff, it's taken a lot of time to try to cut through that crap, redo it. But we're going to reuse those old plates. So. so they'll just go from the west side to the east side, because that was like about a four foot, a, a four foot hole, four foot wide by the it's, whole length of that. Well, it's, uh, it's 40 feet long. Yeah. Um, right in the middle, there's a concrete slab. That's right where they're going to walk mm -hmm. off the off right. the scale and uh, the one rail I've already cut it to make it wider they should be reinstalling that while I'm here um, but that hole on the north and south there those plates will actually fit in there real nice okay. and we won't have to spend any extra money to build anything else it's just trying to get it to fit in there so we can get it done okay. well it looks good the pictures yeah. look good I mean Jack and I when was that did an inspection. When was that other scale put in? Do you have any idea? 94, mm -hmm. I think. Okay. Yeah. So I think it was the original scale at the lamp, though, wasn't it? it? It was. It was the first scale there, and uh, it was falling apart. Yeah. Or at least the decking was falling apart. Well, you know, even the top of the cement started getting holes in it. Yeah. So. Anyway, that's okay. all I've got. All right. Thank you, Thank Mel. You. Thanks, Thank Mel. You. Thanks, Mel. Uh, Appreciate it. Yeah. Justin, Fairgrounds report. Morning. 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 How are you? Good. All right. So our attendance to date, 70,531. Uh, and our income to date is $87,437.49 out there. So Justin, let me ask you a question. How do we really track the attendance? I mean, how is that? Is that a 
plus or minus figure? Yeah, it's was kind of an. I'm like, how do you know? I know it's for sure. It, it's difference. kind of an estimation. Uh, when we do events, we kind of estimate the amount Just of people that them. show up. Yep. Or we got a guy sitting there with a clicker. <laughs> uh, a lot yeah, of the was, events keep track of the people yeah, that come yeah. down. Thing. Yeah, I try to get them to kind of keep track of their, their people that come in and then give me their, uh, their statistics when they get done. Uh, some of the ones that do ticket sales, a lot easier. Some of these smaller ones, you know, it's kind of, we're kind of guesstimating a little bit. But we got a general idea. So, okay. so if I do my figures right, it seems like the average person visiting the fairgrounds pays a dollar twenty four per person for use of the facility you would be about correct yes of course i guess it would be nice if we got some people counters and put all over all our doors but <laughs> that would be kind of hard with the outdoor arena so <laughs> no i i the question was asked and i'm like why well, don't i don't I didn't have a good answer. That's why I'm asking you. No, that's our best. That's our best guesstimation uh, of people that come in. So that's kind of how we run it. Okay. Um, this last month of October, we had the True Western All Women's Roundup Rodeo on October 9th. That went good. Um, CSU and the health department put on two more of their workshops in the kitchen on the 19th and 21st for uh, fruit pie filling and and a an advanced pressure canning workshop. The 23rd and 24th, we had another barrel race by Southwest Barrel Racing Association out there that went good. Um, and this last weekend, the Four Corners Dressage and Combined Training Association put on a hunter jumper show. Uh, coming up this weekend, we have the commodity giveaway on the 6th. And we have a team roping going in there on the 6th, which is Saturday. Uh, and then Southwest Barrel Race Association is going to put on another barrel race November 12th to the 14th, a three-day deal, uh, followed by Four States Junior Rodeo the next weekend on the 20th and 21st. Uh, and then December 4th, we're doing commodity giveaway out there again uh, with another team roping by Rafter R Productions. We do got our winter practices kind of going on out there Monday through Friday. I kind of listed that there. Mondays we have roping practices. Tuesdays they're going to start next week is, is their best guess for the uh, Four Corners Youth Roping Practice, which did used to be uh, the rodeo team. Now we're going to open it up to all youth, or that's kind of the way that they're going to run it, so any youth can go out there now, not just the members of the youth rope or youth club, youth mountain club, sorry. Um, Wednesdays is the pony club out there. Thursdays, 4-H horse club is supposed to start this week. Uh, and then Fridays is roping practice again. And then if there's anybody that that is interested or wants to do any of those, they can always, you know, get a hold of me and then I can kind of get them in touch with the, the people that put on each of these. Uh, and it's a good thing for the youth as well, so... Other than that, our racetrack is now all cleared out. There's nothing left behind. Everything's been taken out, so we're good there. Um, we're starting to do maintenance out there this winter. We didn't get a lot done last year just because we were working on remodel and that stuff, so this year we're planning on doing a lot more painting and things like that around our indoor facility. Try to spruce it up, make it look a little nicer. Um, that's about all I got for you guys. If you guys got any questions. No, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So the only question I have is do we want to go ahead and this is kind of more directed asking for your help here. Uh, do we want to go ahead and DC that meter down there? I mean, there's no reason for that to be there. There's no power consumption that you're going to need down there, correct? Uh, so there's two meters down there at the track. Correct. There's one of them. One is for the pumps, right? Yeah, one is for the pump, which, which we, we need that. Yeah, and they're going to be, we still got a little bit of water we can get, but it's probably not going to run very long, and then we won't use it all winter. Um, 
Do you but tell yes. them you're not using it? They can shut it off. The other one? No, we're not using How it. How much at all. is the reconnect fee for the pumps well, that, and the stuff? I, I don't know. I'm asking, I, do I we couldn't want answer that. Actually, DC it or do we want to just shut it off because just, there is no. Just put it on vacation. Vacation, vacation because there are, there are still fees that we're paying down there. Right. Just so that it's available. But if we're going to have no consumption down there, there's no reason to just be paying that. Right. Yeah, it's just, just the whatever the regular rate is and i'm not sure what it is off the top of my head but correct yeah and it, and it can be re-energized at any time oh it's yeah just, it's, if it's it, on vacation. now it's just computer controlled so just call the office and they'll they'll shut it off for you okay. yep we can do that i'll i'll see what the reconnect stuff is just in case yeah we have a you know Crazy yeah, reconnect fee. Deal. I don't even think there's a reconnect or anything. You just tell them from yeah. this date to right. this date. That's, that's where we do our irrigation right. pumps. I mean, okay. Because if that one up. is for the pumps, which obviously there's not going to be much left. No, and, and I'm surprised we're still getting what we're getting out of it. But we did try today, and we, we got a little bit this morning, so we can still get a little bit of water. And the other one can be. Yeah, the other one we can put in. Because that will be going into a new somebody else's name, not ours. Yeah, you can, hopefully uh, yes. Yeah, just ask them. You know, uh, they'll help you with options if you want. You know, to talk options. So. Okay. Okay. Disconnects or, I mean, just put it and, on vacation. And not necessarily it has to be a DC. It could be a right. Mm -hmm. it, it could be a vacation. Yeah, vacation thing. thing. Yep. So gotcha. just find out. Okay, I will. See what we can do with that. Okay. So. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. Thanks, Justin. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, unfinished business. I don't. I, I don't have any that I, I can don't recall. have any notes that we had any unfinished business that we had to make decisions on. No, on, we've created some, today. but we don't have any to yeah. address today. <laughs> okay, with that, then we have uh, an executive session called by our legal. Um, and, and Commissioner, if you wouldn't mind, <coughs> if we just jumped into the reports, Jim McLean was going to participate in that executive session, and I sent him a text. He should be here momentarily. Okay. Well, then we, we can do that. So if you want to start, Ian, we'll just go ahead with yours then. Yeah, so um, really the biggest thing that I have to report, we did get a trial set for our land use code violation case. That's been set for December 17th, and so um, we'll start preparing for that. Um, we are going to reach out to Mr. Belden. Um, as part of our legal responsibility, we do have a, a duty to discuss possible settlement with him, and, and so we'll discuss whether um, you know, he can possibly get that thing into, into compliance in time um, before our trial. That certainly would be the ideal, but, uh, but we will be prepared to move ahead in December with that trial. Um, the other um, update from this week, we did get the official notice of appeal on the Road 41 case, so that case will be um, progressing up to the Court of Appeals. Um, the district court will send the Court of Appeals the record from the district court case later this month. Um, and then after that, a briefing schedule will be set and, and we'll begin um, filing briefs for that case. So I have been in touch with the insurance company's attorney, Gordon Vaughn. Um, we'll continue to, to work through that. Um, other than that, um, several of our civil cases remain uh, in holding patterns awaiting court orders. And, uh, and so that's where we're at. Okay. All right, thank you, sir. Um, is James going to be around, Jack? Or? Yes, he just sent me his report, and I just emailed him back that he's on <coughs> deck. Okay. So while we're waiting for James, I could go into the rest of... Uh, Jump into... Yeah, Bonnie's ass. Finish. Let me find out where we... And, and I see <coughs> Mr. McLean's here, too, so at any point in time, we can go okay. into that. I'll go ahead session. and finish these reports so that we're done with okay. with everything, and then we'll, we'll break for that. Okay. Um, so Bear is giving us a 6% rebate, um, which is, it's around $1,000, so we'll, we'll need that for herbicide purchases. And then, again, reminding the commission that we are going to do an after-the-fact amendment for Bonnie's because so much has changed during the year, but for the knapweed treatments in Mancus, um, the Colorado Department of Natural Resource has giving, given her 
$10,000, um, and this is reimbursable. Their year goes from July to June, and so we would need permission um, for the uh, from the commissioners to begin spending the money this year, and then I think the easiest way is whatever is unspent at the end of the year, we just tack on to next year's budget knowing that it's all reimbursable. But we'll just need to add this to the list that Phaedra's keeping track of for budget amendments. Okay. So, so it would, uh, I guess the motion would need to be to amend the budget for $10,000 in the NAPWEED treatment line item with any unspent at the end of our fiscal year to roll over into 2022. Okay, gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> I so move. Okay. Now second it. <laughs> okay, it's been moved and seconded to accept the, <clears throat> would you scroll down there, Shaq? Um, the NAPWEED treatment um, from the state of Colorado, the Department of Natural Resources, in the amount of $10,000, and the number of POGG1 PMAA 2022 um, 000 2289 um, again, of $10,000 to be added to the NAPWEED uh, budget line item for the Noxious Weed Department and be reimbursed and added to the 2022 budget. Correct. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Anything else? Not from me today. Okay. All right, very good. Um, commissioner's report, since I don't see James, can't uh, go first today. Lots of phone calls, lots of texts. Uh, <laughs> did go to city council meeting. Uh, talked to him. They... Uh, Municipal judge is getting ready to retire, so wish him well. And uh, that's about all. It wasn't much significant at, uh, at the city council meeting. Okay, very good. We'll keep that. <laughs> Mr. They didn't Stevenson. Have near as much excitement as we have. You know. uh, last week I attended the Mancus Town Board meeting. Um, <clears throat> they're still working on their short term rental plans over there and how to work all of that stuff. The, um, the after action review that the Forest Service and everybody had on the timber sale up in the Chicken Creek area, the contractor did nothing wrong and was within his specifications of the contract up there. So they found that they're gonna, before they do any more contracts up there, they're gonna go through there and mark some trees to protect the shaded trails and stuff next time. Hmm. And stuff like that. November 6th, this Saturday, they are having a ribbing cutting for their new bridge. They're finally gonna get traffic across that. Oh, good. So they so were pretty, this week. yeah, this Saturday, they were pretty happy about that. <clears throat> um, there's not going to be two Mancuses over there? Mancus no, North they're going to get them South. all back in one spot oh, okay. so everybody can complain at one spot, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and I did learn that they are re recharging the canal to Dove Creek to get municipal water out there for Dove Creek. So anytime you think that ag water is protected over municipal use, try again because None of those farmers got any water at all out there. Now they're charging that whole system just to get municipal water out there. So that can happen at any time. So I, I, I hope we can, I, I want the people to have water, but I don't like the farmers taking second seat when it takes a ton of water to charge that canal out there and the loss of water involved in that project is gonna be a bunch, so. And that concludes my report for this week. Okay, um, 
I actually missed the uh, Sparrow Grand Opening. I don't know if they actually had it. I think it was canceled, right? No, uh, they had it. So they did have yeah, it. Yeah, so that was part. Was of, I missed a part of that. Yeah, I, t I also participated via Zoom for uh, housing solutions. Good. And um, uh, they did have their grand opening and cut ribbon cutting and all that on and the meeting on the same day. So it's pretty great. Good. Yeah. So I, I had saw that cancellation and I just assumed they had canceled everything. Uh, did. <clears throat> Uh, have a housing authority meeting on Thursday and one of the big discussions that we talked about are some of the single lots that the housing authority um, owns that we can't really do multifamily um, because some of them just aren't big enough so we had discussed it a little bit and uh, we'll probably if the board chooses we'll move forward to getting uh, those out on the open market so that we can use those funds to move elsewhere and to two bigger projects. Um, that was the meat potatoes of that. Um, like Commissioner Lindsay said, and I wanna, I wanna get this back out to the public so hopefully you were listening. A lot of the emails that we are receiving should not be coming to us. Um, a lot of the phone calls that we are getting should not be coming to us because it has not stepped up to the level of the Board of County Commissioners. There is a process that has to go through when you're talking about land use and issues and concerns and it goes through the planning commission before it comes to us with a recommendation from the planning commission so i urge people to do their homework to actually figure out the process we don't have the disruptions we had in here this morning and the process has to be vetted and gone through we don't just make arbitrary changes to land use without it going through the process. So um, with that, hopefully everybody will do their homework and I'm gonna leave it at that. I mm -hmm. see uh, James Dietrich is in here. I'd like to just tack on to that for the public listening in YouTube, trying to influence the board of commissioners before a hearing comes to them is like trying to influence a judge before a trial, it's unethical. So anyway, with that, I'm going to go on with my report and I'm going to bring James Dietrich up. So Shaq, I sent you an email. I think that's got one image. And then uh, in Dropbox, we'll go on to some other images. I'll help you navigate to those uh, when we get to it there. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so I want to catch you up on one of the things I've been working on here uh, recently. Um, another uh, big surprise, another obstacle with the uh, Paz Mesa Verde. I keep hoping we're going to hit the easy button on that one somewhere here, but uh, apparently not. Um, the latest uh, thing that we've run into is crossing state land board uh, lands. Um, so uh, as the commissioners are all aware, we've tried really hard to keep that uh, pathway alignment within the CDOT right of way. Um, assuming that we, because it was CDOT right away, this is a transportation project, um, that everything would be copacetic as long as we do that. Uh, we've got one spot, and it's really, it's a little bit difficult to see there, Shaq would have to zoom in, where the, uh, uh, where the trail does deviate outside of, of the uh, right of way, and it's mainly because the right of way gets really steep there, um, and it's just kind of a short spot. The particular uh, spot that we're looking at is really pretty well landlocked because of those uh, large drainages that are to the north of it. And I'm going to estimate we've got maybe about 200 feet of trail that lies outside of, of the right of way. So that is a kind of a separate uh, issue in my mind. Um, after conferring with the state land board, the state land board is telling us that um, they believe this trail is recreation, not transportation oriented, um, and therefore it would be uh, an additional use that is not permitted um, through the agreements that we already have with, with CDOT. Um, we're trying to make the case that no, all the way along we've said this is a multimodal project, this is a transportation project that gets from people, people from uh, um, Cortez or Mancus to Mesa Verde or to the places that they choose to recreate. Um, and from that perspective, and also the fact that we, we have to build this um, according to the federal guidelines, which makes it an ADA trail. Um, the feds have always said that this is a transportation project. Um, so it, and it's part, partly why we're building this thing the way we're building it. Otherwise, Shaq's idea of just letting folks go with a mountain bike out there, um, they'd have something carved in there in no time. 
So um, we're making uh, a very strong argument that this is just this is no different than adding another lane to the highway. This is a this transportation and it's getting bicycles off of that route. So um, uh, we were told that um, this is well definitely we're going to have to take this to the state land board to to argue our our position on this and hopefully have a, a, a solid outcome on this. So, and along the lines of what we just heard here earlier, that is the proper procedure to follow. We, we go to our, our local state land board person first. We work with him on that. Um, it's outside of his hands when we uh, um, are, are told that um, perhaps this is not a transportation project. And so it will move forward to the state land board the way it's supposed to go. And we'll just make a nice uh, solid argument um, that uh, supports our case. Hopefully we'll have a, a solid outcome in this. Uh, one of the other, uh, you know, we may, I, I feel pretty confident we will get a solid outcome with regard to the trail. We may have to pay for that little bit of right away where the trail deviates and goes out on the state land board uh, property, about 200 feet of that. That should not amount to much. What we do want to avoid though is is the state land board um, asking us to, to pay for the right away that's already within the state transportation right of way. Um, and then the other complication on that is it's a 30 year limit on that. And so every 30 years, we'd essentially have to go back and re-up that contract um, and pay again. So we're trying to avoid that uh, all the way along. The numbers are, are to me, pretty big. Um, they're estimating about 40,000 for, for that stretch of trail through state land board. You know, when you, you divide that up, it's roughly $1,300 a year. Um, we haven't got a firm figure on that. That's just the estimate they're throwing at us. At, at, and, and that is to me, um, you know, unacceptable. I don't think we can, uh, you know, that's just not, not what this trail's about. Um, we need to really work with the state land board to see if we can find a, a reasonable solution to this. Again, I'm confident, um, but remains to be seen. Um, if we include, and I see Jim's in here, if we include the broadband um, as a part of this trail, which we're trying to do, trying to kill two, two birds with one stone, that could throw another monkey wrench into it because that is, is not viewed um, in the same manner that uh, normal modes of transportation is, is viewed, even bicycles. So we will have to make a strong argument on that. And I would still argue that that is transportation. Um, it is within, uh, largely within the state uh, CDOT right of way. Um, and so it should be treated no different than any other utility um, or adding another lane to the highway. So anyway, that is what we're up against. It'll probably be some negotiations. I'm sure this will probably take a little while, but I think we'll get to the other end of it. And I feel good that we'll have a positive outcome. So, but did want to let the commissioners know that that's what's going on. Um, and I don't know if Shaq can kind of zoom in on that to the, uh, from where I'm looking at it to the left-hand side of the screen. Um, and if we can't, uh, it'll be where, fine. Where at? I can zoom Appro in. Approximately there by the uh, racetrack. That would be a good area to zoom in. So I wanted to point out what we have here. The green line indicates the trail alignment so far. Um, as you can see, we've uh, been talking about trying to get the underpass at the west end of the fairgrounds. One of the things that does is it really avoids uh, having the trail run through where we've got the flume. Um, a lot of the things are on the south side of the highway there, and, and it gets pretty difficult. And we would have to uh, cross, the, cross the arroyo there too. Um, but more than anything, it really creates more complications when you bring the trail in at the east end of, of the fairgrounds because you have to cross all the fairgrounds facilities um, to get people over to Phil's World. So to me, um, putting it at the west end of the fairgrounds makes a whole lot more sense. We may still be in right of way for that, that remaining section that goes all the way into Cortez. If we can negotiate right of way um, outside of, of the highway right of way, um, then we're still set up. But we'll, we'll use the west end of the fairgrounds to uh, traverse that area and get it up over the hill and bring it back into Cortez that direction. Um, so uh, the other thing I would note that uh, this particular location, you've, you've all driven through there, and you know how steep it is on the south side of the highway. It falls away really rapidly there. So for drainage, when you're working with a, an underpass like that, that is super important. Um, and I think the drainage will work uh, far better at this particular location. You can practically just daylight that out the other end of that tunnel and uh, have it run down in, into McElmo Creek then. So uh, much easier to, to handle that in this particular location. Uh, so anyway, I think that kind of gets you up to speed on the Paz Mesa Verde. Um, I also went out and I uh, had, had to attend a meeting yesterday up at CWCB. We talked about getting the tires out of the reservoir. I don't know if Mel caught you up on that. Um, if he did, I won't. Uh, 
He did not. He did. Okay, so uh, so it looks like uh, they will will uh, proceed with trying to get those tires out. That's uh, down there by the launch ramp. Um, so CWCB is is going to send a, a, a track hoe down there and trucks, and they will try to grab as many of those tires as possible. Um, unfortunately, we've got added complication with archaeological sites right there, and. Uh, uh, maybe not surprisingly, some of the archaeological site has eroded away and actually deposited itself in the tires now. So you know, nothing is ever easy. Um, but uh, we feel pretty confident that uh, that SHPO will approve this, this project. Uh, I think the Forest Service is making a really good case for it. Um, DWCD is on board. Um, and they will remove as many tires as they possibly can. They're going to take them up to one of the upper parking lots, disassemble them because they're all held together um, by a big piece of uh, round steel stock that's been welded into place. So definitely there's going to be some time disassembling those, um, and then Mel will be able to take them at the landfill um, if they're, they're all taken apart like that. So, um, so we've got that. Um, and then, uh, Shaq, if you could uh, navigate to Dropbox. Mm -hmm. And under federal lands, yep. And there should be a folder called BLM parking lot. I actually toured that last week myself. Oh, you did? Yeah, Excellent. I, I, well, I was out driving roads last okay. week. Okay. Uh, that was one of the stops that I actually was able to make. Very actually, good. It's very, very good. I've been trying to get up there for a long time. It's just a long ways away. <clears throat> Since we had the meeting up, um, up by the lake, this was a good time to get to it. Um, I really think this, the BLM did an outstanding job with this, this park area too. I think it's a great asset for the county. Um, I noticed there was not a lot of tracks in there. In fact, you know, I went to each individual parking uh, position and it looked like maybe one set of tracks per, per parking lot. So, so far, um, not a lot of public use. There um, was which, uh, one car up there when I drove through. Okay. Yeah. And no cars when I drove through at all. Um, there were some tracks in there, and it's certainly getting some uh, curiosity visits, I think. Um, but uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't appear to be a landslide of use, at least yet. So um, did an excellent job. They put these uh, big steel pipes in for lane dividers. Um, just all the way around, I thought they did a great job. Working with the terrain, you can't really see any of this parking area from, from the subdivision. Yeah. They get it down over that rise. They work with the trees really well, and they tuck these uh, individual parking spaces in between trees um, or clumps of trees and such. Uh, so a very, very nice uh, job, I think, that they did here, and they should be commended for it. So. And I would agree. Yeah, I don't think you can see anything from the lower area from the houses that their biggest concern was from. And Looks good. So, um, okay. you know, I don't know, I, I haven't talked to Rob about this, but, um, you know, maybe we're put, uh, putting a traffic counter out there to kind of determine, uh, you know, if we are seeing an increase in traffic out there, I don't know if we could put one right up there across the entrance into this parking area also to determine, you know, what level of use we get. Um, and again, I haven't talked to Rob about this, but, uh, you know, I'll bring it up to him. And if he feels like maybe there's some value, we could investigate it so. well and, and there might be a little bit more use right now because hunting season is going on certainly and, that, and it will be until what the kind of almost the end of november that is December, open yeah. to hunters so yeah, it is uh, yeah. people can <coughs> utilize that parking lot now to get out to that blm ground yeah yeah it's part of the reason i went out uh you know the day i picked is you know thinking you know we, we should see some evidence of, of hunting out there mm -hmm. uh, but really virtually no sign of, of heavy use there, i'm sure there's probably been a few folks up there sure but, uh, yeah, so anyway, all the way around, uh, we, I think we've uh, had a, a pretty good partnership on that parking lot, and things are looking good. I think it's mitigated about as good as you can for the, uh, the residents that are living around it. So, and we'll continue to monitor the situation. Okay. Very good. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. I think that's my, my report for the day. Appreciate right. it. Thank you. Question. Okay. Thanks, yep. James. Thanks. All right. Actually, I had one, one last thing that I wrote down, and not for you, James. This is just oh. basically for the general okay. public. Public. Um, is that this is uh, last month was uh, breast cancer awareness month and this month is no shave November for men so uh, I will not be shaving this month so you'll have to deal with me looking like Shaq. I prefer the term Shaq Squatch. Yes. Anyway with that gentlemen we will um, proceed with an executive session. I move we go into executive session for conference with the attorney for the purposes of receiving legal advice on a specific legal question under CRS 24-6-402 parentheses 4 parentheses B. I'll second it. Okay, it's been moved in second to go into executive session.
for a conference with the attorney for the purpose of receiving legal advice on specific legal questions under CRS section 24-6-402 parentheses 4 parentheses B. Included in that session will be our IT director Jim McLean, <coughs> our uh, administrator Shaq Powers, attorney Ian McLaren, three commissioners Lindsay Candelaria Stevenson and our clerk and recorder uh, Kim Purcell. And then, commissioners, I would just add that this, the purpose of this executive session will be to answer legal questions pertaining to the broadband project. Okay. So with that, um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.
brother does the news. Okay, gentlemen, you are live. I would make a motion to come out of executive session. Second. Okay, it's been moved in, seconded to exit our executive <coughs> session at this time. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, gentlemen, we are at the end of our um, report. Unless, attorney, you have anything else you want to add? And nothing further. Okay. Then I would uh, entertain... Motion to adjourn. I'll second it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to adjourn this um, <clears throat> November 2nd meeting of the Board of County Commissioners. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.